Welcome everyone to the Coral Restoration Consortium Genetics Working Group webinar about maximizing the adaptive potential of restored coral populations. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Reef Resilience Network and the Coral Restoration Consortium's Genetics Working Group. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Eliana Balms and I'm the host and the speaker for today's webinar and the chair of the CRC Restoration Genetics Working Group. I'm a professor of biology at Penn State, and I study how corals adapt to a changing climate and environmental stress using molecular tools. The CRC Genetic Working Group has a vision that says that we will guide practical genetic management and the development of genomic tools and strategies that are based on evolutionary principles and that will aid the recovery and increase the adaptation potential of threatened coral communities. In order to achieve this vision, we've already produced two products. These are peer-reviewed publications. And the first one of these, Considerations for Maximizing the Adaptive Potential of Restored Coral Populations in the Western Atlantic, is the topic of today's webinar. We are also currently working on guidelines for the use of assisted gene flow and coral restoration about how to develop standard methods for high throughput phenotyping of coral genets. And um, after today's webinar, I think it will become clear of why that is so important, as well as the use of Symbiodineaceae in coral restoration. The Coral Genetics Working Group has uh, these members who worked on these two products, Andrew Baker, Sarah Davies, Andrea Grotoli, Carly Kinkel, Sheila Kitchen, Ilsa Kuffner, Todd Lajeunesse, Misha Matz, Margaret Miller, John Parkinson, and Andrew Shantz. And since the, we finished the two products that I mentioned earlier, we have gained a number of new members and we're happy for the help because we have a lot of work ahead of us. If you want to get involved, you can visit this website, crcreefresilience.org. For info on the CRC, contact Michelle Lowe um, at noaa.gov. And for the Genetic Working Group, you can send me an email at bombs at psu.edu. Before we begin, here are some housekeeping questions. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be about an hour and 30 minutes. There will be a Q&A question and answers period at the end of the presentation. And there will be an opportunity for additional Q&A online on the Reef Restoration Network Forum, which is an interactive online community of coral reef managers and experts from around the world. At the end of the webinar, we'll provide instructions on how you can participate in that. There are two ways you can ask questions during the Q&A session. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions, and we will keep track of these for uh, the end of the presentation. Or you can raise your hand during the Q&A session, and I will call on you to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon next to your name. If you're having te technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please type a message in the question box, and we'll try to help you resolve the issue. So before I introduce our presenters, please tell us a little bit about yourself by answering the following questions. I'll give you a few seconds to respond, uh, and then we'll share your responses. It looks like, so the first question is, what is the focus region of your work. It looks like um, from the majority of people that responded, 72% of people in the audience are from the Caribbean um, and Atlantic. 14% in the Pacific, a 9% other, 4% Western Indian Ocean, and then 2% Southeast Asia. Wonderful. I'm so glad you could all join us from these different regions. And I hope um, and think it actually is true that the what we're sharing today is not only applicable to the Western um, Atlantic, but also <clears throat> worldwide. The second question is, um, please tell us about the work you do. 
Okay, Liz, are the results up? Yep, can you see them? No, I can't. <laughs> okay, um, so the poll res results show 39%, which is the majority, are scientists or researchers, um, followed by um, a tie between students and restoration practitioners at about 20%. And then we have 10 and 12% marine resource managers and other respectively. Thanks everyone for joining us. I hope um, all of you will find this interesting. So thank you for participating in the poll. The insights I would like to share are the results of about two years of work of the Coral Restoration Consortium Genetic Working Group, which I share. And the goal of the working group was to come up with a detailed plan as possible to maximize the future adaptive potential of restored coral populations. So, the goal of this plan is different from alternative management goals such as increasing coral cover or maintaining or increasing species diversity. This plan particularly um, emphasizes the adaptive potential of the uh, restored coral populations. As we are all aware, worldwide coral cover has declined tremendously over the past few decades. And in the Caribbean, reefs now rarely exceed 20% coral cover. As a result of this long decline, active restoration has a long history in the Caribbean, and perhaps this explains why the Coral Restoration Consortium got started in the Caribbean, and most of the initial work has focused on this region, even though now we are beginning to expand into other regions as well. So from an evolutionary perspective, the goal is to establish self-sustaining, sexually reproducing coral populations that have sufficient genetic and phenotypic variation to adapt to changing environments. In order to achieve this goal, we have come up with a plan that has these major um, areas. We need to acquire genets for propagation, so we need to find out from what environments should we collect them, how many do we need, we need to monitor their performance to select those genets that have favorable um, traits. We want to propagate sexual recruits from those genets, and we need to decide who to cross with whom. And then finally, we want to outplant them to build the sexually reproductive and self-sustaining populations. And we are giving recommendations on how to do that outplanting as well. So during the webinar today, we will cover these aspects of the plan. At our immediate disposal, we have two main interventions. We can fragment, grow, and outplant adult colonies that are already existing on the reef. For that, we break off small pieces, we bring them into inshore environments where growth rates are really high, and this allows us to increase coral tissue biomass fast and restore coral cover on the reef. However, with this intervention, what we're doing is we're propagating the existing genetic diversity. Nothing changes about the diversity. There's no sexual reproduction involved. There's no recombination of genetic material. So we're we are preserving what we have. The second intervention involves crossing gametes to facilitate sexual larval propagation. And in this case, we are crossing eggs and sperm from coral colonies where we collect the spawn uh, in the wild usually and perform crosses to then have coral larvae that we can outplant. And this does result in the, the mixture of parental genomes and the generation of new genetic diversity. So for both of those types of interventions, the question arises on what genets to propagate, either in fragment nurseries or via crossing. And in order to be able to distinguish between genets, we need to genotype them for one. And the other is we want to know what kind of traits to have. And so we need to monitor their traits. And we make a number of recommendations about which traits to monitor in the paper. And I will get back to that at the end again as well. But how many genets are sufficient to maximize the adaptive potential 
of restored populations. How can we possibly know how many genets do we need? And should we try to bring every genet into propagation? Michel Matz is interested in how marine organisms adapt to their environment at the genomic level. He's a professor of, um, at uh, UT Austin, and he will discuss exactly our reasoning and evidence behind the recommendations of how many uh, genets to select. So I'm gonna switch over to Misha right now. All right. Okay, now we're in business. Sorry for that. So before talking about the corals, I'd like to clear certain misconceptions about evolution in general. And I apologize ahead of time to the uh, scientists in the room. I just know that even my fellow biologists are sometimes having this uh, thoughts about evolution that specifically that it's really, really slow process and it takes hundreds of generations and millennia of in years. This is profoundly not so. Evolution is generally in natural populations, not slow process. You can have dramatic uh, changes in phenotypes of the organisms like this stickleback fish just over 50 years in those lakes turn from marine phenotype to the uh, freshwater phenotype. And even more spectacular example uh, with these anole lizards which changed in their thermal tolerance. Interesting trait for us too. Uh, just over a single winter storm event. How is that possible? What kind of magic is at work? So the thing is, most people think about evolution as depicted on this little graph. It's a very slow process when you start with genetically uniform group and then new mutation arises and takes over the population and then long time passes until the next good mutation arises and that one takes over population, so on and so forth. This would be really very slow because it uh, is limited by the, the influx of new beneficial mutation. Fortunately, this is not how things evolve in nature. In nature, there is one important thing which is happening, which is uh, sex. Basically, you can not just rely on individual mutations, but on combinations of already existing mutations. And uh, during sex, you recombine them into new combinations, and which can be then selected upon. And this is a much faster process, well, because recombination does not have to wait for the new mutations to arise. It just che checks normal combinations of them. And uh, this would be faster, but not quite as fast as real, because here, see, at the beginning, we all start with the all black. Everybody is genetically absolutely uniform. So this is wrong. In natural population, typical situation that you have starting genetic diversity, which we call standing genetic variation. Original sort of bank of possible genetic variants which can be recombined or selected upon. This is a really fast process because new mutations might not even be necessary here. There is usually enough standing genetic variation in natural populations for just the recombination and resorting them and reshuffling to create novel adaptive variations. Uh, to be uh, selected upon. So, standing genetic variation is a common feature of all species on this planet, from humans to corals. And most importantly for us, when the bleaching event happens, there are always corals which bleach less and they tend to survive and those tend to give rise to the uh, new generation of corals. So evolution is supposed to be happening uh, based on standing genetic variation. Uh, another thing which is even better for corals is that they evolve not like a single population, but as a group of populations uh, existing across the environmental gradients. So uh, in this way, the, they basically evolve to their own little conditions while exchanging microns. And this is even more a uh, strong driver of standing genetic variation because it's basically like multiple working groups looking for solutions to problems while exchanging nodes. This is a very fast system. Uh, it, especially when the conditions change, the adaptation of the whole species could simply involve reshuffling of already existing adaptive alleles. So conditions got warmer, okay, the warm adapted alleles just migrate and uh, rescue from uh, decline all other populations within the range of dispersal. So this could be really, really, really fast. And uh, so that's basically like exchanging know-how between working groups. So uh, 
And we do know that there is a lot of standing genetic variation there, which is really genetic. Uh, in this particular experiment, well, you, if you can cross if you can cross corals from a warmer place and corals from a colder place and cross them between each other, you will find that the offspring are the most tolerant offspring are the ones which actually had parents from the warmer place. And this, for us, geneticists tells that there is a genetic variation which natural selection can act upon in coral populations. I also do, we've done a bunch of modeling, us and other groups, and they demonstrate that indeed models. Uh, they indicate that evolution must uh, be a very powerful force in corals. Evolution based, as in this little cartoon, on exchange migrants between populations which bring over the adaptive. So uh, the idea of the restoration efforts is to harness this natural process and try to help it out, to make sure that it happens in the most efficient way. So uh, one thing you could do is and that, that's what we want to advocate for is assisted gene flow basically don't wait for the larvae to migrate over there to new populations or naturally just help them move them over there move uh corals or basically genotypes from uh places which are like future conditions to the places which are not quite like future conditions which are becoming like future so from warm places to cool places, this will facilitate uh, survival of the cooler places as the conditions start to warm. Uh, and the question becomes, as Iliana already asked, okay, but how many exactly corals do we have to sample? How many do we have to move? Do we have to move like the whole reef? Is it really important to transfer all of the genetic diversity? How many is sufficient? So uh, we can, think that we actually need to move uh, the good representation of locally adaptive alleles and these locally adaptive alleles should be relatively common and in genetics a common allele is something which is at five percent frequency which, which is found basically in one out of ten genomes or one out of uh, yeah one out of ten genomes is ten percent frequency one out of 200 genomes right so that's pretty rare but still consider it common so uh, how many corals do we need to sample that the majority of those. All we need to know is the distribution of allele frequencies in coral species, and we know that from our previous genomic work. So given these little distributions, we can simply calculate how many corals would contain the majority of adaptive alleles, uh, or the majority of common alleles, more than 50% of them. So the answer to this uncomplicated question actually is surprisingly three <laughs> given the distribution of allele frequencies three corals just three of them six genomes will sample more than 50 percent of all the potentially adaptive alleles and if you want to sample 90 percent of them it's 10 that you need to uh 10 corals that you need to get suddenly uh the procedure of assisted gene flow and creating a nursery stock becomes quite doable so the question is, is okay three corals from the whole great barrier reef that's all we need well no actually we need to sample about that many from each habitat type where we expect a local adaptation happening and this is the question which margaret will cover in her part where exactly do we are we going to sample corals from so uh one last thing i will have to say uh there is still a common thing that super uh, basically a super coral idea why not just find or maybe genetically engineer the hardiest coral possible and just use it for all the restoration efforts why is that a bad idea because it will simply put us back into this situation where uh, evolution is basically prevented because it will have to wait for new mutations to appear it will be very very slow which would mean that there will be no capacity for long-term persistence and a high chance of the whole stock succumbing to some sort of novel threat which you didn't account for when you were selecting this coral so uh, this is definitely not the way to maximize the adaptive potential of your restored populations one last thing i would like to touch upon if when we're moving corals over between different environments between very different environments yeah if the really red coral from warm place goes into a really blue population He's very valuable as a transplant because his genes are really different from the local population. 
but it also has the least chance of surviving there because for the same reason it has completely different uh, genetic makeup and uh, it will not survive in this environment so what to do the solution here is to uh, plant not the corals themselves but the hybrids between foreign and local corals basically this way we can artificially combine their genomes together and rear the offsprings which would actually combine the tolerances from both populations and these would have much higher chance of survival uh, when you outplant them in either population actually. So the take-home messages from my part. Natural evolution of corals is expected to be fast and efficient based on the redistribution of standing genetic variation. Assisted gene flow is one feasible way to help it. We can actually make a difference there. Uh, and only three corals are needed to be sampled to represent the majority of locally adapted genetic variants, which is good news. Uh, and we probably should be looking into lab rare interpopulation hybrids if we really want to achieve uh, these assisted gene flow with the best efficiency and the less, least mortality of what we plant in the field. And with that, I will, uh, oh, thanks myself. And somebody <laughs> must take the uh, steering wheel from me. <laughs> thanks, Misha. That was great. Um, are we good? Do you see my uh, presentation screen again? Yes. 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 So, as Misha just explained, sourcing three or four genets per reef along environmental gradients should be sufficient to capture a majority of the genetic diversity, including adaptive alleles. So, what does this mean? What, what kind of different environments are we talking about? So, in order to enable the persistence of coral populations exposed to the severe selection we are now facing from many different stressors such as warming temperatures but also changing ocean chemistries and oxygen levels we recommend a mixed provenance strategy where genetically unique colonies or genets should be sourced both locally as well as from more distant environmentally distinct sites so this all can be uh, discussed under the heading provenance and Margaret Miller, who's research director of Sea Core International, will um, answer that question for us. Should we use only local genets? And if not, how far away should we, uh, from how far away should we get those genets? And I will be advancing Margaret's slides for her. Margaret, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so I, as Illy said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about provenance and where we are sourcing material. And that's what is provenance is just sort of a fancy word. I have the dictionary definition here, but it just refers to the origin or the sourcing for restoration material that we're going to be using. And so we can think about the provenance either for a particular nursery that we're propagating, or we can think of provenance at the level of, a, of, an, of an outplant site or a restoration site. And it just refers to the sourcing of the material that we're gonna be using. Next. Traditionally, um, we have always used a provenance strategy that, um, that utilizes local material. That means local organisms were collected and propagated for use in a local location. And this is um, a precautionary approach. It's based on the understanding, as, as Misha mentioned, that corals are very um, closely adapted to their native environments. And this would mean if we are very closely adapted to a local environment that's stable, that if we bring foreigners in, it may be not just that those foreigners do more poorly because they're not adapted to that environment, but they may in fact compromise the fitness of the local population through out, what we call outbreeding depression. So that means if that locally adapted sets of genomes are disrupted by breeding with foreign genomes, that that can actually be harmful to the local population. However, if you can go to the next slide, our current situation is that the, whatever those corals are locally adapted to is actually changing because our planet is changing. And so our expectation is that um, if the local conditions are changing, and we can see here just as an example, the figure on the right here shows a climate, local climate projection for the amount of time um, until we expect annual bleaching stress to affect the corals in those regions. And it's you know, ranging from a couple of decades. 
this begs the question, of course, that right now the Great Barrier Reef is facing the third major bleaching stress in five years. So at what point <laughs> we want to kind of acknowledge that maybe these you know, some of these uh, stressors and environmental changes are happening faster than we want them to. But this begs the question, if local conditions are changing, then the corals probably also need to change in order to be able to persist in those environments. Uh, next slide. So this is the, um, the idea of needing um, to design or to restore coral populations that are able to adapt quickly. And based on, um, general evolutionary biology, we understand that there are different characteristics of a population which will enable them to uh, adapt more rapidly. And Misha mentioned some of these. Um, one of them is just having large populations. They're able to reproduce more effectively. And so large population size helps um, ad adaptation proceed more quickly. Misha explained how this standing genetic diversity um, which is, again, interrelated with local adaptation is also very important because it provides um, the, the raw material, it provides the new characteristics that selection can act on to affect this rapid evolution. And the third characteristic is connectivity. Again, for the reasons that Misha explained, if we have a steady genetic diversity over uh, a species range, we would like for those um, different genes and different traits to be able to um, transit between local populations that are locally adaptable so that they can benefit um, populations in areas where those, um, that environmental change has occurred. Next slide, please. So we know, Eliana showed you a picture describing that coral populations in most places in the world are declining rapidly. Um, we think that uh, standing genetic uh, diversity is still quite high, but we also have concerns about the levels of connectivity um, and general the general success of uh, sexual reproduction in corals. Um, this is uh, partly due, we see very poor levels of uh, larval recruitment in natural populations, at least in Caribbean reef building species, but I think this is becoming more obvious in other areas of the world as well that have had recent, more recent population declines. This is partly possibly due to LE effects limiting actual larval supply, but we also probably have poor habitat quality that um, make it difficult for those larvae to recruit um, in different areas. Along with the fact that in warmer temperature environments, um, we know that the developmental rate of coral larvae is also accelerated. So if they reach settlement competency more rapidly, it's quite likely that they're not simply not going to travel as far. So for these reasons, um, it's a good expectation that the connectivity between local coral populations is also declining. Next, please. Uh, yeah, so just to recap then, um, our understanding is that there is good local adaptation and standing genetic diversity across coral species, but we know that the population sizes and the connectivity are probably declining. If you can hit the next button quickly. And so, and one more, please. And so, our goals for restoration um, are really to um, increase population sizes, but also to be uh, concerned about connectivity and the recombination of that standing genetic diversity. And so we use from assisted gene flow as a restoration method where we're deliberately looking at connectivity or enabling um, the traits from one population to be utilized in another. So to recap and contrast this, the local is best strategy um, is based on the understanding that corals have local adaptation and that in stable environments, that local adaptation is beneficial in the local, um, local location and the local environment. Um, and that when we bring uh, foreign genomes in from outside, that might cause um, a breakup or a, a disintegration of that fitness, which accrues to that local adaptation. Next. The contrast and the, face, the situation that we believe we're facing much more currently is still using this local adaptation as a premise. 
but it's understanding that in a situation of rapid environmental change, that local adaptation um, becomes local maladaptation relatively quickly as the environment changes around the organism. And so in this scenario, outbreeding or again, importing um, or bringing foreign genomes means that that standing genetic uh, diversity from other environments um, can benefit the local population by spreading new adaptive traits into the local population. Another reason that local is best is perhaps not best, especially for long-lived uh, species that um, are, have suffered declines, and the Caribbean's elkhorn coral, Acropa palmata, is a perfect example of this. Um, because this is a highly clonal species, individual genotypes are likely extremely old, um, probably hundreds of years old. And so if we think about when that genotype recruited to this location hundreds of years ago, it's quite likely that the environment was very different. And so these large old genotypes that are currently present, although they persist, they're probably not the most fit to recruit in those locations currently just because they're old. And so this is another reason that local is not necessarily the best option that we want to rely on exclusively in restoration projects now. Next, please. Can you advance the slide? So what are we wanting to do? We're wanting to then obtain genotypes across as with as many different adaptive traits as possible to construct our restored populations. And so that means we want to collect those three or four genotypes from as many different environments as possible. In many cases, these uh, different environments may be available in short geographic distances. Um, this slide illustrates um, what are often very strong cross shore gradients in many different environmental parameters, um, including temperature, but also parameters such as nutrients or sedimentation or light levels. Um, these are all environmental factors that very likely lead to local adaptation in populations. And by sourcing corals from across this, these gradients with as much diversity as possible, we're able to incorporate those adaptive traits and more of them into our restored population. Next. So just to kind of recap these different strategies, I described local as best. This little cartoon shows the star is your restoration site, your outplant site that you're trying to restore and the blue circle shows the provenance area, the area that we, you're obtaining material from. So local is best um, is depicted by the oh, complete overlap of where we're sourcing material and where it's going back to. Next. Um, a composite strategy is illustrated this way, where we have um, material that's drawn over a wider geographic range, but it's centered on the local. So it's, it's, it's skewed towards the local, but it includes um, a, a range of more distant genotypes, somewhat indiscriminately. If you can hit the slide once. This is um, kind of the natural expectation for um, species with long uh, larval dispersal distances, where the majority of, of larvae maybe are from local um, sources, but you're going to have diminishing numbers from intermediate and long, um, far, far distant populations. Um, next, please. One more, this is a strategy that illustrates a, what's called a climate predictive strategy, where if we understand that, for example, our site is getting warmer, why don't we just grab corals from a warmer environment and use those to populate our restoration site? And of course, the problem here is similar to what um, Misha described for a super coral. We can't predict this perfectly. The timing is gonna be different, and there's just a lot of things that can go wrong with this strategy. Next, please. And so as Ileana described, what we're suggesting is that we want a mixed provenance strategy where we're utilizing both local um, sourced organisms because they are adapted to the locality to some extent, but also a range of distant and more diverse genotypes from across a diverse range of environments, but perhaps skewed towards what we can expect the local environmental conditions to be in the future. So this is called a climate adjusted strategy. Thank you, I think that completes mine. Thanks, Margaret. So 
with this discussion, we have now um, suggested that we need three to four genets from several environments per region. And we have also suggested, or I mentioned earlier, that practitioners should propagate genets with more, more, one or more phenotypic traits that are predicted to be valuable in the future. So what traits are we talking about here? And this is actually a area of ongoing uh, discussion and research. We suggest in the paper uh, the following biometrics for monitoring. These include partial mortality rates, wound healing rates that uh, indicate something about the energy reserves of your fragments, their skeletal growth rates, leaching and infectious disease traits, and importantly, sexual reproductive output, because again, our goal is to have sexually producing, self-sustaining populations. In order to really understand which genets are performing well, which are reproducing well, we need genotype phenotype databases urgently. When we achieve our goal of being able to have sexual reproduction, in the nurseries or through um, our crossing interventions, we suggest that you want to obtain eggs and sperm from more uh, than six genets because we have found that some genets have very full fertilization success with each other. So the more genets you have, the better your chances of achieving, achieving fertilization success and you're able to mix uh, genetic um, material effectively. We then suggest to batch culture those genets to produce genetically diverse populations and then really try to minimize the amount of time these gametes are spent in cultivation to minimize the selection cultivation may uh, impose on these gametes. Then after they're settled they should be outplanted uh, to the growing to the uh, final restoration site. And here the suggestion is to outplant them during a stage when they're still actively taking up um, Symbiodiniaceae from the environment. Again, with the thought in mind that the local, the available Symbiodinium cells are probably the ones that are adapted for that local environment. In terms of outplanting designs, because again, our goal is to enhance sexual reproduction, we suggest that in any one restored patch, you should be um, planting near each other uh, four to six uh, genets. Not so close that they will start competing with each other soon, but close enough that there is a good chance of eggs and sperm um, fertilizing each other once they become sexually mature. This brings me to the role of symbionts in restoration. The manipulation of established symbiont communities in adult corals that you might be propagating asexually in fragment nurseries is limited compared to our ability to manipulate the symbiodinium communities in the recruit and larval stages, at least for those who have horizontally transmitted um, larvae. Now, here again, the thought is to outplant the juveniles to local environments where they can take up any locally adapted symbiodiniaceae. This becomes a problem when you're trying to deal or trying to restore very rare species. And the perfect example of this is Dendrogyra cylindris, the pillow coral, which in the Caribbean has always been rare and now is even rarer than it was for a number of reasons. There are now so few adults on the reefs in many regions that it is not clear whether any juveniles that we are raising and outplanting will have access to the dominant symbiont found in this coral, which is also actually rare. We don't know of any other coral species that houses the symbiont, Symbiodinium dendrogyrum. And uh, this may require special attention from managers. We know that restoration can be effective, and this is one of my favorite examples of active restoration that has been very successful. This is a restored reef from Lisa Karna of Fragments of Hope in Belize. 
who has used genetically diverse stock to create these um, beautiful high coral cover restored sites. But how do we keep track of these restoration activities? It is crucial that we know what works and what doesn't. And we need to genotype every coral in order to do so. This can be a real problem for most practitioners who do not have lab or computing facilities and still need reliable and easy to use genetic tools to identify genets. There are several groups working on solutions to this problem. And um, my lab has worked on developing a, a high throughput SNP chip for the acroprids that works in Caribbean and Pacific uh, acroprid corals. Uh, here's a website you can visit to look at that with the final goal of creating something like a coral stud book. And what these high throughput genotyping tools are supposed to enable is that people who have very little access to tools can sample the coral, send them to a company, in this case, this is Thermal Fisher, for them to do the genotyping. And then when you get the data back, be able to use a browser, upload the data to a standardized workflow, hit go, and get your genotypes back without needing to know a lot about coding or bioinformatics or wrestling with input formats and so on and so forth. These, um, in this case, we have uh, not only developed a standardized workflow, but also uh, combined it with a database that keeps track of how many times this particular uh, SNP chip profile has been observed before. So we're starting to get into the into the direction of being able to build these coral stud books with genotype phenotype associations. Overall, then, um, I guess I should mention here is that you know this it's still not ideal. What we really want is a tool that we can take out on the boat where you can put a coral sample uh, into a tube, get an answer in 10, 20 minutes or so, and then can proceed with your local field work. Now, uh, to summarize what we talked about today are recommendations to acquire for genets for propagation by sampling three to six genets from diverse local environments, um, monitoring their biometrics in order to find those genets which uh, have desirable traits for propagation, both through fragmentation and to enhance sexual uh, reproduction, how to um, do that sexual reproduction and then the outplanting in such a way that you end up with genetically diverse um, populations that can reproduce and hopefully rapidly adapt to our changing environment. So the basic guidelines that we have outlined here should help to maximize the adaptive potential of reef building corals in the face of a rapidly changing climate. But we can only get us or we can only help bridge uh, the, the time, shorten the time um, that corals uh, are able to adapt to changing environments so much. It, it remains an important goal to curb cor global carbon emissions in order to reduce rising temperatures as fast as possible. And with this, I would like to thank the CRC Genetics Working Group members who've worked very hard on um, producing these guidelines. And we would now uh, love to hear from you and answer your questions in order to help us um, find out what the biggest needs of the practitioner in the community are um, uh, using these guidelines, but also going forward. Thank you so much. Hi hey everyone, this is Caitlin Lustig. I'm gonna help facilitate the question and answer session. Um, so the two ways you can answer question, ask questions, sorry again, is to type them into the um, question box uh, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. I'm gonna try and be fair about uh, how we ask these questions and we will um, have the ability to move over to the Reef Resilience Network Forum um, to answer any questions that don't get answered here. Um, so I'll get started. The first question was, what legal framework exists to move coral from warmer places to Florida, and does the Caribbean allow this? 
um, and how much would be charged for corals to be moved. Margaret, would you like to take this? I can uh, take a stab at that. So I'm, I'm afraid the short answer is there isn't a good legal framework for enabling these types of cross-jurisdiction movements at this point in time. Um, we obviously think it's a very important thing that we need to make progress on, um, but there are not good legal frameworks for being able to do it. There are some, you know, fledgling efforts that where there are some corals that are, you know, in captivity in different places that have been moved, and, and there's some opportunities to bring for you again, um, implementing these um, approaches in ways that are sort of minimize the risks. There are risks um, to moving corals around, as I mentioned. They, you know, in some ways, the local genotypes are going to do better, and some of the foreign genotypes are not going to perform well. But we need to begin testing these methods and implementing them in risk minimizing ways. And there are definitely ways to do that. Um, but at this time, this is something that I would urge the um, the managers and the the other stakeholders that are on the call to take seriously in terms of um, helping to develop those types of uh, legal frameworks and governance guidelines that will enable these um, uh, again risk minimizing movements to proceed. Um, okay, thanks. Um, there's a question specifically for Misha. Is there a reference for the number of colonies needed to capture genetic diversity? Uh, reference? I mean, this calculation was presented in the paper which Ileana uh, mentioned. That's where this appears the first and only time so far. Okay. But uh, other yeah uh if the question is where to where the original information about like distribution of allele frequencies come from uh feel free to contact me by email or somehow yeah, i'm googleable i will send you all the information you need on that um okay you mentioned that older genotypes might, might not be best to source from, but if they, rem they remain today and are um, visually healthy, wouldn't it make sense that they have adapted successfully throughout the years? Yeah, maybe I, I can, I can get, get a, take a stab at that. Um, so it is indeed uh, qu quite awesome, really, to, that we have some of these really old um, genets, especially in the Caribbean, but also I think in the, in the Pacific, if you think of some of the really old and big varieties, Lobata colonies, that are still around. So, you know, it certainly speaks um, to, you know, the, 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 the success of this particular, these particular coral genets that's been, that's been around for a really long time. But there's two, um, sort of features of coral biology we have to keep in mind. For one, some of these old coral genets are propagating now uh, mainly through asexual means by repeated fragmentation, where and their sexual reproductive potential uh, in, some, in some cases has uh, greatly diminished. So while they're still um, producing a lot of egg and sperm, sometimes these egg and sperm are either of poor quality or they're so far away from any other genotypes that their fertilization potential is actually quite low. So in the plant literature, this has been described as a um, as, as these large coral and this in our plant uh, genets, they can be um, evolutionarily extinct already. So what do we do about this? For one is, of course, we can um, collect egg and sperm from these large successful genets and uh, enable their sexual reproduction by combining them with others. Uh, but there's also, I think, uh, a real need for, for, for research in trying to understand really what the value of these large versus young, younger genets is in terms of jumpstarting um, some of the sexual reproduction that has declined dramatically, especially in the Caribbean. I think in the Pacific, uh, this has begun, but it's not quite as severe 
as it is in the Caribbean at this point. Can I just hey, make Joanna. one other yeah, comment? Yeah, we'll, we'll all want to add something to it. <laughs> Margaret, go. Okay, um, so it is true certainly that many of these old large genotypes um, do appear to be thriving in whatever the current situation is. One thing to remember is that the um, the the adult, you know, uh, coral colony thriving is maybe has different requirements than a larva needs to recruit. And so to, to emphasize, again, you've heard each of us emphasize this, all of these processes are dependent on successful sexual reproduction. And that means that the larvae need to be able to recruit. So even if those old uh, genotypes are thriving, the adult ramets, it doesn't necessarily mean that their larval offspring are particularly well suited to recruit in that location. So because the, the requirements of those different life history phases are, are likely to be different. Yeah, I'd like to just clarify one more uh, thing. Uh, and yes, I, that's a, exactly what I wanted to say. I just want to clarify it because it was not clear in the question that as the colony grows, however old it is, it has still the same genotype as it was 600 years ago. The genotype does not change. And so it's basically a genotype of a larva who, which recruited 600 years ago. It was really good back then, it survived, but uh, as Margaret said, it's, there is no guarantee that the larva with the same kind of genotype would be successful today, if that makes any sense. Okay, I'm going to switch over and take one from a raised hand. Dave Vaughn, if you are listening, I'm going to unmute you. Yes, uh, I have a question. If um, nowadays a few people are doing sexual reproduction and the fragmentation in combination so that they are getting a number of new genotypes, but if nowadays we can get uh, not just a couple, but maybe a hundred or even a thousand new offspring in land-based hatcheries. When is enough enough of new genotypes if you are also suggesting that we genotype each and test each one? Is if three new ones are, are good, is a hundred too many? Is a thousand too many? Uh, should I, hey Dave, should I take this? Sure. Yeah. So, okay, I'm, uh, I'm not exact, uh, I'm not 100% sure that I understood exactly what the problem is. So what we are trying to suggest is uh, how to maximize your uh, representation of potentially adaptive alleles when you're just creating the nursery. After you started breeding things with the, with the nursery, uh, this, I mean, our advice doesn't go that far. What, what, what you're gonna do with the offspring? How you can keep track of the offspring? This becomes progressively. It's basically question number two. You need to keep track of the pedigree. That's the the thing in breeding, and for us, I guess it would be that important. Uh, for that, you don't have to genotype everyone. You just need to keep track of whose parents is is who. Uh, it's also, uh, I guess, important to say that the original sampling of adaptive genetic diversity is at the stage of combining all these genotypes from nature into your nursery. After that, you're just creating new combinations of those alleles. So you don't bring in new alleles after this. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's relevant for Dave's question right now. Dave. Uh, well, as an example, you know, Margaret has been able to get us a number of of uh, fertilized, uh, basically larvae through many of the uh, uh, genets that she's collected, uh, let's say, of uh, palmata. And we've been lucky enough in the past few years to get more than a few hundred, but maybe even a thousand uh, new recruits to survive up to one year old to start making more fragments of it asexually, but tracking thousands of genotypes of uh, the next generation, I, I, I assume is very uh, recommended to have all that genetic diversity, but when is enough enough? Uh, 
Yeah, Dave, I think obviously you are bringing up sort of a, a next a next phase problem that, you know, I think most um, efforts have not gotten that far yet. It certainly is the case that tracking thousands of genotypes in a culture situation becomes pretty difficult. I think um, in terms of how many of those you might retain for propagation, I'm guessing it might be a smaller subset of that and many of them would go out to outplanting as opposed to entering a fragment-based propagation scheme. And I think, I don't know if Ileana and, and Misha would agree, but I I think, and, and I think um, the team at Mode is in the process of sort of screening those for particular phenotypes. And I think that that would be the best approach. If you have thousands of offspring to, to choose from, if there's an opportunity to screen their phenotypes and choose a subset of those thousand offspring that seem to have beneficial phenotypes, Maybe it is still, you know, tens or twenties or fifties of that you could select from those thousands of offspring that you've you've um, produced that you would go on then in terms of fragment based propagation. That that would be a sort of a you know a a, a nursery a, a new nursery providence sort of process that you would undergo. And we okay. to make sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I it, my thoughts on this are that you know we really. So the you know once you are able to get sexual reprodu reproduce um, new genetic diversity, you want to actually expose that diversity to the selective pressures that are out on the reef as soon as possible, and do the let the reef do the selection for you, right? So of those thousands and thousands of genotype you have currently in culture you know, only a subset is going to be able to survive out on the reef, but those are the ones you want, right? And then you undergo another process of enabling their sexual reproduction as much as possible. Um, a, a, a reason for not to propagate um, sex, like your, your sexual recruits in a nursery for too long is because nursery conditions are necessarily uh, and obviously selective in and of itself. You know, nurseries have certain light conditions, flow conditions, feeding regimes, et cetera, et cetera, which is not what it is on the reef. I mean, you know, it, there's there's two separate management goals you can think of. There's there's you know, you know, making a NOAA's arc of genetic diversity in 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 onshore you know facilities. That's one. But what we're talking about here is to try to restore natural coral populations out on the reef, right? So the point of these recommendations is to bring out as much of that genetic diversity as, as soon as possible back to the reef rather than propagating it uh, for any length of time in, um, in captive conditions. I would also like to add, I mean, if seriously, Dave, if you have thousands or several hundreds of offspring uh, of the parents that you know of, and maybe you have samples of those parents, I don't know, that would be ideal. And hundreds of offspring, this is a, a grown in a common garden. Oh my God, this is a uh, treasure trove for a geneticist. I would sequence them for you for free just because I want to map those traits. Uh, if you measure growth rates, I don't know, color, how healthy they are, we can find uh, regions in the genome which are responsible for these traits based on that particular data set. So, uh, yeah, not enough sequencing in your case, I think. Well, thank you. Thank you all for your suggestion. I, I always like the co combination of doing at least some sexual reproduction to get new genotype, new genetic diversity, then using um, some of the microfragmentation or regular fragmentation to make more of those and observe in the wild, like you said, to see which of those look like they are, you know, potential uh, winners. And uh, I always thought to keep about half of them back at the lab so that you knew you had which genotype out there was do still doing good and, and still had multiple samples of it to be able to propagate more if it looked like a good one. I guess they, what, we, what we're trying to advocate is general culture. And if you're doing this work, uh, have a sample of every single genotype in ethanol stashed somewhere in the freezer, just in case, and keep track of genets. If you fragment something, you somehow need to keep track where these bits coming from. 
and this will already give us something to work on. Yeah, I think it's good. I think, you know, as you probably all know, I've been retired from Moat now for, for over a year, but we were able to produce successfully over a, a couple thousand Palmata for five years worth of settlement that, that Margaret's group uh, provided. So we, we're not sure the exact um, mixture of which, you know, parental stocks were, were from each one, but each new recruit has been uh, labeled and propagated now depending on the number of years, up to hundreds. And I was picturing that if we get one one year recruit up to about the size, we can cut it into 20. If we hold 20 in the lab and take 10 and put them out in the field and make the du duplicate or triplicate in a couple locations and watch for a year or two, then you would know which one of those to uh, um, maybe, you know, ones that have some interest. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's great. Let's go on to another question. Yeah, I was going to say. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to do another on the um, let you ask your own question. Zachary Miller, you've had your hand up for a while, so I'm going to unmute you. Oh, Zachary Miller, no. Okay, we'll go on to Tom Moore. Hey guys, thanks for a great presentation. Um, the question I had was, so in Misha's presentation, I talked about the three genotypes to get the, max, the allele uh, density or up to 10, but I'm assuming that that assumes that all of those corals are spawning at the same time and they are effectively crossing with each other um, in kind of a equal pattern. And we know that spawning is, does not occur in as much synchrony as it used to occur. And I'm wondering whether or not this could this approach could be modified with a formula that looks at actual spawning synchronity in a particular area or rate of spawning to come up with a number that's more regionally accurate about the number of different genotypes that would be necessary. Uh, this Go, yeah. go ahead. Liana, you want to go? Yeah. All right. So I think Tom, you you hit on a really important um, issue that we're grappling with. It, it sort of uh, also had to do with the age of the you know some of the old genets are are you know not as good in in what they're doing in terms of sexual reproduction. You have incompatibility issues between genets, even if they spawn on the same night. Some of the genets spawn on different nights. Um, you know, some genets make more eggs than sperm, some more sperm than eggs. I mean, there's a whole bunch of issues with getting um, the ideal equal representation of each of those genets in the gene pool for the next generation. That's 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 reality, right? So um, I think the the point of this is that you know is to to say that you know it, you don't need a huge, not, you do not need to sample every single genet you have uh, to and to to preserve locally adaptive alleles. I think you know it's it's putting the point is to to say that you know a few genets carry a lot of the locally adaptive alleles uh, within them. So I don't know that we'll ever arrive at an exact number for every single location. Right. I don't think that's that's reasonable. But I think what is reasonable is that, you know, if you know that you need at least three and you know that your your local population spawns very asynchronously, you know, you might need to increase that number to six or 10 or maybe even 12. Right. But uh, at least it gives you a starting point um, for for what you need to aim for. Yeah. Can I just add one other point? I think. It's important to remember, so the three number is in terms of sampling the local adaptation from different environments. That's the step where you're capturing the genetic diversity from the entire species, where you're trying to capture as much of that as possible. And that three to four number is, is the number of, of genotypes that we need to capture and bring into propagation. Now, each of those genotypes is going to have different characteristics and traits, and, and we've mentioned a bunch of these reproductive characters and traits, 
that can affect their, the, the success of that genotype in an actual rest, restored population. You're going to be mixing those three genotypes from a range of different source locations, hopefully in an outplant situation. And so the, 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 it is important to think about having more than three, or we had used the number four to six, and that's based on the, um, just the fertilization success improving with that six number. But those factors, Tom, that you were talking about in terms of asynchrony and spawning and particular um, incompatibilities between individual parents, those are really going to be manifest in that outplant situation. And so definitely you're going to want to, there's, you want to have mix and match from different source locations in those outplanted populations. And yes, larger numbers than four to six are probably going to be needed especially for species where we know those characteristics like asynchrony and spawning and individual incompatibility are to be expected. So, I guess just, there's two different steps that we were talking about. And yes, we would definitely want the numbers to be larger in terms of what we're bringing together in an outplanted population to ensure that sexual reproduction can be um, and recombination can be successful. I really don't have much to add. It's already been like, yeah, like I guess they said already what could be said here, except uh, just to emphasize that, I mean, three in three, four is like a best case scenario situation, but the worst case scenario situation will probably not be too much different from this, maybe like up to 10, right? So I, I, I what we're trying to emphasize is that the, it's really not that many corals you need to capture the adaptive genetic diversity and a precise estimates for each location could be improved and it might be an interesting exercise for research but I don't think they will be vastly different it's not like orders of magnitude difference okay um, in regards to the local is best concept in isolated habitats with high frequency of endemic organisms that depend on the corals would you modify the mixed provenance equation is there a potential to change the corals in such a way that the coral is more adapted to conditions but can no longer provide the habitat support to other organisms? Yeah, we've we've discussed this uh, a little bit, right? I mean, we you know there you know we these recommendations here are particular are very much focused on getting coral populations that are sexual reproducing with each other, right? But what these recommendations really have not touched on is how or which ecosystem services are explicitly, you know, managed by doing so. You know, this was not part of the part of the thought process. So, for example, you know, if you're really worried about fish habitat and you need structurally complex um, you know, reef environment, and you therefore want lots of branching phenotypes rather than more plating phenotypes, for example. None of this is part of these particular recommendations per se. Um, part of that question is also, you know, if you have a warming local climate, how many other members of the ecosystem are going to be staying put or are you going to get new invaders you know or like habitat brain shifts of um, associated organisms all of those are moving parts i think that have not been considered in these particular recommendations so um i'm a little hesitant to sort of come up with something on the spot to uh answer that particular question because i think you know trying to model these whole ecosystem changes is 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 an act an area of really active research right now where you know there's there's as far as i can tell and please uh, margaret and misha help me um there's there's no you know good answer to that particular um question right now on how to even start modeling it yeah i, I think that's true and i guess i would say i would just add that's really the reason that the mixed provenance strategy is we think important where you're going to maintain some of those local organisms in the mix and you're going to introduce um, the, the traits and alleles from other places as well. Certainly it seems like if you have these very specialized associations where that could, that could be disrupted um, by imports, 
Um, as Una says, I think it seems like there's a pretty likely, a large likelihood that they're going to be disrupted anyway with environmental change. But that's one of the risks that we referred to. Um, I think including both types of provenance um, is our, again, our best least risk approach um, to mitigating or minimizing those sort of ecosystem level risks that, yes, are sort of, I think, fairly impossible to predict with any sort of precision. Yeah, I can only add that uh, this issue of like, let's move from species restoration goal to the community restoration goal was a big theme in the uh, Coral Restoration Consortium leadership meeting in Costa Rica recently, just before the lockdown. So uh, yeah, people are starting thinking about these problems and it's going to be the priority in the future in coral restoration. Okay, can you define habitat in a more practical way? Is it important to define it based on environmental conditions or based on genetic differences? I would say, really quickly, I would say that uh, habitat in terms of uh, how, how many different habitats, I mean, what is a different habitat? A different habitat is a reef which looks different from other reefs, just contains different community of things. So chances are the environmental conditions are also different enough to create these community differences. That's basically rule of thumb. At the moment, we are not exactly sure which are the most important environmental factors which structure uh, coral genetics, and we are working on this. But the rule of thumb would be, uh, yeah, just sample different looking reefs. Yeah, and I, I think to, to really emphasize what Misha was saying there, it's like, you know, the you know you know your local reefs you know which reef acts differently than another reef even if we're at this point not necessarily able to quantify what that exactly is beyond you know measuring temperature with a hobo temp um or you know taking some light measurements i think uh, at this point you know really we are recommending you know use your local local knowledge uh to identify as as many different reef environments as as you you think you can right it's like shallow four reefs uh lagoonal type areas um you know reef slopes you know back channels um those reefs that have lots of algal blooms on them those that don't um urban sea walls yeah sea walls you know anything that you know boat channels like you know habitats that you know seem different to you because uh, you know that, as Misha mentioned, there's different communities in them. And I think at this point, you know, you you trust your local knowledge and make a decision based on that until we get better at measuring what exactly the important environmental variables are that dictate local adaptation in coral. There is one, though, I can, I can bet a six-pack on that it will be really important for pretty much every coral species is depth. And I'm not talking about deep mesophotic depth. It's just above 10 meters or below 10 meters. This is going to be, I, I kind of have a feeling, I already looked at a few corals and other species did, other, other people <laughs> did look at other species. And it seems like depth would be the strongest gradient. So whatever grows well in the shallow will not grow well in, in the deep and vice versa. But I, I mean, jury's still sort of out on this. Okay, I'm going to open it up to Jen Moore. You're unmuted, Jen. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can give some advice or a, a rule of thumb on either percent decline in abundance or, um, you know, exact population size or effective population size of a species on your reef track that. Um, that's when you know that's kind of the threshold that it is important to consider assisted migration or assisted gene flow as opposed to understanding that you know you've got enough diversity left in your population and you should just be working within your population. Oof. Ilya, yes. it's yours, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know that I don't know that I can that I can come up with a rule of thumb. So I think the um so it's you know there there's been there's people who've worked on this problem on connecting census size to effective population size uh for a long time. Like Robin Waples comes to mind. He's uh 
conservation, um, population geneticist who's worked a lot on fish. Um, and, you know, I've, I've talked to him a bunch on trying to understand, you know, at what point, you know, does effective population size become uh, so small as to basically constitute a bottleneck, right? This is what you're talking about, right? Like when is genetic diversity, um, you know, so low that you end up with a bottleneck that really is 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 compromising your your local genetic diversity. And um, these are these are actually quite tricky problems um, to solve with genetic tools. Um, well, actually, the, the 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 population genetic theory behind this is totally straightforward. Our problem for corals is is the demography. Is that you know, in order to do this well, um, uh, Robin recommends that you need uh, good demographic data, such as you know the number of reproducing adults, the age of the reproducing adults, um, you know, sex ratios. Um, you know, like you know, reproductive output numbers, recruitment densities, none of which we have. So it's 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 a real challenge to answer those those questions from a theoretical standpoint um, using best practices that have been developed for other systems where such demographic numbers are much more easier you know easier to obtain. So um, I I think at this point I you know I. I I would maybe you know step step back a little and and think about connectivity and and um, species ranges and I would think that if you are like you know I know Jenny you're particularly worried about Florida and Florida is you know a is at the at the edge of of the range for for Caribbean corals right it's 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 the last outpost right before it becomes you know temperate so it's a um, it's a it's a it's an area where you know I would think that there particularly it's this the gene flow is um, you know is especially important in uh, helping to reduce uh, local bottlenecks that we know we have because you know coral cover in the, in the Florida has declined so dramatically. Uh, if I yeah, may I, I, I just, a little bit. Uh -huh. What I just what I guess what I'm trying to clarify or, or get a finer point on is that, um, you know, I guess it's how do you how do you balance the risk of of the potential delirious de deleterious effects of doing it with, um, you know, with basically, you know, we have managers and permitters who are concerned about allowing these types of activities to occur. And I guess what I'm trying to say is what is the scientific backbone to say that it is appropriate to do um, because of the population has gotten to a point where it is, it is more risky to not do it. Mm. Oh, well, that's a different question, though. I wanted to add, I, I mean, just from a genomics perspective, if you try to look at the genetic diversity of corals, which are out there right now, they look just like corals 200,000 years ago. Genetics doesn't, I mean, all these declines are too recent to actually show up as decline in genetic diversity yet. So with genetics takes a few hundred generations to actually catch up and equalize with the new declining population size. So right now, so far, to me at least, with uh, methods that we use, uh, the corals look like they were doing fine. So genetic diversity has not yet show the sign of decline. Uh, however, we're talking about sensor sizes rather than effective population sizes. So effective population size, why I got latched on this? Because this is a genetic term, basically meaning genetic diversity, effective population size. So effective population sizes look good, sensor sizes look bad. <laughs> and uh, whether, yeah, whether it's risky to move corals around and let them breed together is a very important question and it's it's a risk of outbreeding depression uh, we think it's low but it needs to be experimentally demonstrated what do we need to do to this is to model that and do some experiments like really highly controlled safe experiments with these transplants just to demonstrate how things work at, at first we need to be able we need to have the uh, regulations in place to allow just research purpose sort of uh, transplants if that makes sense. I, I think, Nisha, I, 
yeah, you know, I think effective population size is sometimes used in, in you know, in two different contexts. Effective population size can also be used to understand, you know, how is, you know, what is the, what's the breeding potential, you know, what's the, what's the, you know, which part of the population is contributing, con you know, genetic diversity to the next generation, like looking forward, right? And that's where the issue comes in. It's not the standing genetic diversity, which is still high, as the which part of the population is still genetically producing and actually contributing that sending genetic diversity to the next generation. And that's, I think, where the concern comes in. And yes. the yes. right. And so I think we're in agreement here. So I, I guess, you know, this is the 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 you know, I, I use that term more forward looking than what you were just mentioning. But in terms of the, you know, the the question I think is I would absolutely agree that you know we need to we need to do some some real serious uh, modeling of various scenarios to think about what the exact consequences are um and i think this modeling the reason it hasn't happened yet is because you know just a few years ago we were quite poor in terms of um the kind of genetic data we need to do that modeling but i think we're making real strides in in, in filling that gap and we're at the point where we can do some of that modeling but still it's modeling right um in terms of assessing some of those risks and misha mentioned there also needs to be some experimental uh you know some 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 wet lab experiments to see how these hybrids if we allow them to happen how they actually perform right so we need both we need the, the theoretical modeling as well as you know doing some experiments to to try this out to get it moving and you know the 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 reality of the matter is that we don't have a heck of a lot of time to get this done i guess i just offer one other observation in terms of judging this risk of doing nothing is higher than risk of of trying assisted gene flow and, and i think it relates to the sort of background trajectory of the population you're concerned about and you know if that trajectory is going down 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 um it seems like the risk is much less than if you have a stable population or perhaps a recovering population. And it, certainly, at least in the case of the Florida Palmata population, the background trajectory of the population is down, 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 down. And so this seems to be, it needs to be taken into account in terms of balancing those risks of trying, you know, doing assisted gene flow versus doing nothing, given that the background population I mean, I would almost probably that's sort of a definition. There is no local adaptation anymore. The population only goes down. Um, so that would seem to me as an indicator, or at least a, a strong suggestion that there isn't a really strong local adaptation at play that's going to be, you know, that outbreeding depression can even happen if the if the if the population is declining so greatly um, as it stands. All right, I hate to do this, but um, we're coming to the end of our time here, so I'm going to have to cut this off. Um, we are going to try to answer um, some of the remaining questions uh, online, and if anyone had their hand raised and has not actually submitted the question um, in written form, please do that so that we have a record of that, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Liz. All right, great. Um, well, thank you so much to our presenters today, Ileana, Misha, and Margaret. And um, thanks to all of you who attended as well and asked um, so many thoughtful questions. We have a lot, a lot more questions that we did not get to. Um, and so, as Caitlin said, we can continue this discussion from today's webinar on the Reef Resilience Network Forum. Um, the questions we didn't have time to get to today, we were recording. Um, and uh, we will make sure that we post them and get as many of them answered and available on the forum for you. And if you haven't yet become a member of the forum, you can um, access it by going to the link on this slide. You can fill out the registration form and then join once your account, your account has been approved, which is a really quick process. Um, and we also have some resources from this webinar, including the scientific paper that the webinar is based off of. That's this first link that's provided, um, as well as a previous webinar that this working group provided in 2017, 
It's available on the Reef Resilience Network website as well as the CRC website. Um, and that's also a really great resource for questions on restoration, restoration genetics. Um, we also provide a link to the CRC Genetics Working Group webpage where you can find a lot more information as well. Um, and again, this webinar was recorded. We'll be sending out a link to the recording um, to our email list shortly. Um, so you uh, feel free to listen back and share with other uh, people who are not able to attend today. And with that, again, we, uh, we really wanna thank you all for joining us today. And we, again, wanna thank our amazing preventer, presenters for doing such a great job and sharing this paper um, with us. Um, everyone, please stay safe and healthy and be on the lookout for more webinars to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.